The Theory of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith Part 3 of the Foundation of Our Own Judgments Concerning Our Own Sentiments and Conduct and of the Sense of Duty, Consisting of One Section Chapter 2 of the Love of Praise and of that of Praiseworthiness and of the Dread of Blame and that of Blameworthiness Man naturally desires not only to be loved, but to be lovely, or to be that thing which is the natural and proper object of love. He naturally dreads not only to be hated, but to be hateful, or to be that thing which is the natural and proper object of hatred. He desires not only praise, but praiseworthiness, or to be that thing which, though it should be praised by nobody, is however the natural and proper object of praise. He dreads not only blame, but blameworthiness, or to be that thing which, though it should be blamed by nobody, is however the natural and proper object of blame. The love of praiseworthiness is by no means derived altogether from the love of praise. Those two principles, though they resemble one another, though they are connected and often blended with one another, are yet, in many respects, distinct and independent of one another. The love and admiration which we naturally conceive for those whose character and conduct we approve of necessarily dispose us to desire to become ourselves the objects of the like agreeable sentiments and to be as amiable and admirable as those whom we love and admire the most emulation the anxious desire that we ourselves should excel is originally founded in our admiration of the excellence of others neither can we be satisfied with being merely admired for what other people are admired we must at least believe ourselves to be admirable for what they are admirable. But in order to attain this satisfaction, we must become the impartial spectators of our own character and conduct. We must endeavor to view them with the eyes of other people, or as other people are likely to view them. When seen in this light, if they appear to us as we wish, we are happy and contented, but it greatly confirms this happiness and contentment when we find that other people, viewing them with those very eyes with which we, in imagination only, were endeavouring to view them, see them precisely in the same light in which we ourselves had seen them. Their approbation necessarily confirms our own self-approbation. Their praise necessarily strengthens our own sense of our own praiseworthiness. In this case, so far, is the love of praiseworthiness from being derived altogether from that of praise, that the love of praise seems at least in a great measure, to be derived from that of praiseworthiness. Most sincere praise can give little pleasure when it cannot be considered as some sort of proof of praiseworthiness. It is by no means sufficient that, from ignorance or mistake, esteem or admiration should, in some way or other, be bestowed upon us. If we are conscious that we do not deserve to be so favorably thought of, and that if the truth were known, we should be regarded with very different sentiments our satisfaction is far from being complete. The man who applauds us either for actions we did not perform or for motives which we had no sort of influence upon our conduct applauds not us, but another person. We can derive no sort of satisfaction from his praises. To us, they should be more mortifying than any censure and should perpetually call to our minds the most humbling of all reflections, the reflection what we ought to be, but what we are not. A woman who paints could derive, one should imagine, but little vanity from the compliments that are paid to her complexion. These, we should expect, ought rather to put her in mind of the sentiments which her real complexion would excite, and mortify her by the contrast. To be pleased with such groundless applause is a proof of the most superficial levity and weakness. It is what is properly called vanity, and is the foundation of the most ridiculous and contemptible vices the vices of affection and common lying, follies which, if experience did not teach us how common they are, one should imagine the least spark of common sense would save us from. The foolish liar, who endeavors to excite the admiration of the company by the relation of adventures which never had any existence, the important coxcomb, who gives himself airs of rank and distinction which he well knows he has not just pretensions to, are both of them, no doubt, pleased with the applause which they fancy they meet with. But their vanity arises from so gross an illusion of the imagination that it is difficult to conceive how any rational creature should be imposed upon by it. 
when they place themselves in the situation of those whom they fancy they have deceived, they are struck with the highest admiration for their own persons. They look upon themselves not in that light in which they know they ought to appear to their companions, but in that which they believe their companions actually look upon them. The superficial weakness and trivial folly hinder them from ever turning their eyes inward, or from seeing themselves in that despicable point of view in which their own conscience must tell them that they would appear to everybody if the real truth should ever come to be known. As ignorant and groundless praise can give no solid joy, no satisfaction that will bear any serious examination, so, on the contrary, it often gives real comfort to reflect that though no praise should actually be bestowed upon us, our conduct, however, has been such to deserve it, and has been in every respect suitable to those measures and rules by which praise and approbation are naturally and commonly bestowed. We are pleased not only with praise, but with having done what is praiseworthy. We are pleased to think that we have rendered ourselves the natural objects of approbation, though no approbation should ever actually be bestowed upon us. And we are mortified to reflect that we have justly merited the blame of those we live with. Though that sentiment should never actually be exerted against us, the man who is conscious to himself that he has exactly observed those measures of conduct which experience informs him are generally agreeable, reflects with satisfaction on the propriety of his own behavior when he views it in the light in which the impartial spectator would view it, he thoroughly enters into all the motives which influenced it. He looked back upon every part of it with pleasure and approbation, and though mankind should never be acquainted with what he has done, he regards himself not so much according to the light in which they actually regard him, as according to that in which they would regard him if they were better informed. He anticipates the applause and admiration which in this case would be bestowed upon him, and he applauds and admires himself by sympathy with sentiments, which do not indeed actually take place, but which the ignorance of the public alone hinders from taking place, which he knows are the natural and ordinary effects of such conduct, which his imagination strongly connects with it, and which he has acquired a habit of conceiving as something that naturally and in propriety ought to follow from it. Men have voluntarily thrown away life to acquire after death a renown which they could no longer enjoy. Their imagination, in the meantime, anticipated that fame which was in future times to be bestowed upon them. Those applauses which they were never to hear rung in their ears. The thoughts of that admiration whose effects they were never to feel played about their hearts, banished from their beasts the strongest of all natural fears, and transported them to perform actions which seem almost beyond the reach of human nature. But in point of reality, there is surely no great difference between that approbation which is not to be bestowed till we can no longer enjoy it, and that which, indeed, is never to be bestowed, but which would be bestowed if the world was ever made to understand properly the real circumstances of our behavior. If the one often produces such violent effects, we can all wonder that the other should always be highly regarded. Nature, when she formed man for society, endowed him with an original desire to please, and an original aversion to offend his brethren. She taught him to feel pleasure in their favorable and pain in their unfavorable regard. She rendered their approbation most flattering and most agreeable to him for its own sake, and their disapprobation most mortifying and most offensive. But this desire of the approbation and this aversion to the disapprobation of his brethren would not alone have rendered him fit for that society which he was made. Nature, accordingly, has endowed him not only with a desire of being approved of, but with a desire of being what ought to be approved of, or being what he himself approves of in other men. The first desire could only have made him wish to appear to be fit for society. The second was necessary in order to render him anxious to be really fit. The first could only have prompted him to the affectation of virtue and to the concealment of vice. The second was necessary in order to inspire him with the real love of virtue and with the real abhorrence of vice. In every well-formed mind, this second desire seems to be the strongest of the two. It is only the weakest and the most superficial of mankind who can be much delighted with that praise which they themselves know to be altogether unmerited. 
A weak man may sometimes be pleased with it, but a wise man rejects it upon all occasions. But though a wise man feels little pleasure from praise, where he knows there is no praiseworthiness, he often feels the highest in doing what he knows to be praiseworthy, though he knows equally well that no praise is ever to be bestowed upon it. To obtain the approbation of mankind, where no approbation is due, can never be an object of any importance to him. To obtain that approbation, where it is really due, may sometimes be an object of no great importance to him. But to be that thing which deserves approbation must always be an object of the highest. To desire, or even to accept of praise, where no praise is due, can be the effort only of the most contemptible vanity. To desire it where it is really due, is to desire no more than that a most essential act of justice should be done to us. The love of just fame, of true glory, even for its own sake, and independent of any advantage which he can derive from it, is not unworthy even of an wise man. The love of just fame, of true glory, even for its own sake and independent of any advantage which he can derive from it, is not unworthy even of a wise man. He sometimes, however, neglects and even despises it, and he is never more apt to do so than when he has the most perfect assurance of the perfect propriety of every part of his own conduct. His self-approbation, in this case, stands in the need of no confirmation from the approbation of other men. It is alone sufficient, and he is contented with it. And this self-approbation, if not the only, is at least the principal object about which he can or ought to be anxious. The love of it is the love of virtue, as the love and admiration which we naturally conceive for some characters dispose us to wish to become ourselves the proper objects of such agreeable sentiments. So the hatred and contempt which we as naturally conceive for others dispose us, perhaps still more strongly, to dread the very thought of resembling them in any respect. Neither is it, in this case too, so much the thought of being hated and despised that we are afraid of, as that of being hated and despicable. We dread the thought of doing anything which can render us the just and proper objects of hatred and contempt of our fellow creatures, even though we had the most perfect security that those sentiments were never actually to be exerted against us. The man who has broke through all those measures of conduct which can alone render him agreeable to mankind, though he should have the most perfect assurance that what he had done was forever to be concealed from every human eye, it is all to no purpose. When he looks back upon it and views it in the light in which the impartial spectator would view it, he finds that he can enter into none of the motives which influenced it. He is abashed and confounded at the thoughts of it, and necessarily feels a very high degree of that shame which he would be exposed to, if his actions should ever come to be generally known. His imagination, in this case too, anticipates the contempt and derision from which nothing saves him but the ignorance of those he lives with. He still feels that he, the natural object of these sentiments, and still trembles at the thought of what he would suffer if they were ever actually exerted against him. But if what he had been guilty of was not merely one of those improprieties which are the objects of the simple disapprobation, but one of those enormous crimes which excite detestation and resentment, he could never think of it as long as he had any sensibility left. Without feeling all the agony of horror and remorse, and though he could be assured that no man was ever to know it, and could even bring himself to believe that there was no God to revenge it. He would still feel enough of both of these sentiments to embitter the whole of his life. He would still regard himself as the natural object of the hatred and indignation of all his fellow creatures, and if his heart was not grown callous by the habit of crimes, he could not think without terror and astonishment even of the manner in which mankind would look upon him, of what would be the expression of their countenance and their eyes, if the dreadful truth should ever come to be known. These natural pangs of an affrighted conscience are the demons, the avenging furies, which, in this life, haunt the guilty, which allow them neither quiet nor repose, which often drive them to despair and distraction, from which no assurance of secrecy can protect them, from which no principles of irreligion can entirely deliver them, and from which nothing can free them but the vilest and most abject of all states, a complete insensibility to honor and infamy, 
to vice and virtue, men of the most detestable characters who, in the execution of the most dreadful crimes, had taken their measure so coolly as to avoid even the suspicion of guilt, have sometimes been driven by the horror of their situation to discover of their own accord what no human sagacity could ever have investigated. By acknowledging their guilt, by submitting themselves to the resentment of their offended fellow citizens, and by thus satiating that vengeance, of which they were sensible that they had become their proper objects, they hoped, by their death, to reconcile themselves, at least in their own imagination, to the natural sentiments of mankind, to be able to consider themselves as less worthy of hatred and resentment, to atone, in some measure, for their crimes, and by thus becoming the objects, rather of compassion than of horror, impossible to die in peace and with the forgiveness of all their fellow creatures. Compared to what they felt before the discovery, even the thought of this, it seems, was happiness. In such cases, the horror of blameworthiness seems even in persons who cannot be suspected of any extraordinary delicacy or sensibility of character, completely to conquer the dread of blame. In order to allay that horror, in order to pacify, in some degree, the remorse of their own consciences, they voluntarily submitted themselves, both to the reproach and to the punishment which they knew were due to their crimes, but which, at the same time, they might easily have avoided. They are the most frivolous and superficial of mankind, only who can be much delighted with that praise which they themselves know to be altogether unmerited. Unmerited reproach, however, is frequently capable of mortifying very severely even men of the most ordinary constancy. Men of the most ordinary constancy, indeed, easily learn to despise those foolish tales which are so frequently circulated in society, and which, from their own absurdity and falsehood, never fail to die away in the course of a few weeks, or of a few days. But an innocent man, though of more than ordinary constancy, is often not only shocked, but most severely mortified by the serious, though false, imputation of a crime, especially when that imputation happens unfortunately to be supported by some circumstances which give it an air of probability. He is humbled to find that anybody should think so meanly of his character as to suppose him capable of being guilty of it. Though perfectly conscious of his own innocence, the very imputation seems often, even in his own imagination, to throw a shadow of disgrace and dishonor upon his character. His just indignation, too, at so very gross an injury, which, however, it may frequently be improper, and sometimes even impossible to revenge, is itself a very painful sensation. There is no greater tormentor of the human breast than violent resentment which cannot be gratified. An innocent man, brought to the scaffold by the false imputation of an infamous or odious crime, suffers the most cruel misfortune, which it is possible for innocence to suffer. The agony of his mind may, in this case, frequently be greater than that of those who suffer for the like crimes of which they have been actually guilty. Profligate criminals, such as common thieves and highwaymen, have frequently little sense of the baseness of their own conduct, and consequently no remorse. Without troubling themselves about the justice or injustice of the punishment, they have always been accustomed to look upon the gibbet as a lot very likely to fall to them. When it does fall to them, therefore, they consider themselves only as not quite so lucky as some of their companions, and submit to their fortune without any uneasiness than what may arise from the fear of death, a fear which, even by such worthless wretches we frequently see, can be so easily and so very completely conquered. The innocent man, on the contrary, over and above the uneasiness which this fear may occasion, is tormented by his own indignation at the injustice which has been done to him. He is struck with horror at the thoughts of the infamy which the punishment may shed upon his memory and foresees, with the most exquisite anguish, that he is thereafter to be remembered by his dearest friends and relations, not with regret and affection, but with shame, and even with horror for his supposed disgraceful conduct, and the shades of death appear to close around him with a darker and more melancholy gloom than naturally belongs to them. Such fatal accidents, for the tranquillity of mankind, it is to be hoped, happen very rarely in any country, but they happen sometimes in all countries, even in those where justice is in general very well administered. The unfortunate Callus, a man of much more than ordinary constancy, 
broke upon the wheel and burnt at Toulouse for the supposed murder of his own son, of which he was perfectly innocent, seemed, with his last breath, to deprecate not so much the cruelty of the punishment as the disgrace which the imputation might bring upon his memory. After he had been broke and was just going to be thrown into the fire, the monk, who attended his execution, exhorted him to confess the crime for which he had been condemned. My father, said Callus, can you bring yourself to believe that I am guilty? To persons in such unfortunate circumstances, that humble philosophy, which confines its views to this life, can afford, perhaps, but little consolation. Everything that could render either life or death respectable is taken from them. They are condemned to death and to everlasting infamy. Religion can alone afford them any effectual comfort. She alone can tell them that it is of little importance what man may think of their conduct, while the all-seeing judge of the world approves of it. She alone can present to them the view of another world, a world of more candor, humanity, and justice than the present, where their innocence is in due time to be declared, and their virtue is to be finally rewarded in the same great principle which can alone strike terror into triumphant vice, affords the only effectual consolation to disgraced and insulted innocence. In smaller offenses, as well as in greater crimes, it frequently happens that a person of sensibility is much more hurt by the unjust imputation than the real criminal is by the actual guilt. A woman of gallantry laughs even at the well-founded surmises which are circulated concerning her conduct. The worst-founded surmise of the same kind is a mortal slab to an innocent virgin, the person who is deliberately guilty of a disgraceful action, we may lay it down, I believe, as a general rule, can seldom have much sense of the disgrace, and the person who is habitually guilty of it can scarce ever have any. When every man, even of middling understanding, so readily despises unmerited applause, how it comes to pass that unmerited reproach should often be capable of mortifying so severely men of the soundest and best judgment may perhaps deserve some consideration. Pain, I have already had occasion to observe, is in almost all cases a more pungent sensation than the opposite and corresponding pleasure. The one almost always depresses us much more below the ordinary, or what may be called the natural state of our happiness, than the other ever raises us above it. The man of sensibility is apt to be more humiliated by just censure than that he is ever elevated by just applause. Unmerited applause a wise man rejects with contempt upon all occasions, but he often feels very severely the injustice of unmerited censure. By suffering himself to be applauded for what he has not performed, by assuming a merit which does not belong to him, he feels that he is guilty of a mean falsehood and deserves not by the admiration but by the contempt of those very persons who, by mistake, had been led to admire him. It may, perhaps, give him some well-founded pleasure to find that he has been, by many people, thought capable of performing what he did not perform. But though he may be obliged to his friends for their good opinion, he would think himself guilty of the greatest baseness if he did not immediately undeceive them. It gives him little pleasure to look upon himself in the light in which other people actually look upon him. When he is conscious that, if they knew the truth, they would look upon him in a very different light. A weak man, however, is often much delighted with viewing himself in this falsehood and delusive light. He assumes the merit of every laudable action that is ascribed to him and pretends to that of many which nobody ever thought of ascribing to him. He pretends to have done what he had never did, to have written what another wrote, to have invented what another discovered, and is led into all miserable vices of plagiarism and common lying. But though no man of middling good sense can derive much pleasure from the imputation of a laudable action which he never performed, yet a wise man may suffer great pain from the serious imputation of a crime which he had never committed. Nature, in this case, has rendered the pain not only more pungent than the opposite and correspondent pleasure, but she has also rendered it so in a much greater than ordinary degree a denial rids a man at once of the foolish and ridiculous pleasure, but it will not always rid him of the pain. When he refuses the merit which is ascribed to him, 
nobody doubts his veracity. It may be doubted when he denies the crime which he is accused of. He is at once enraged at the falsehood of the imputation and mortified to find that any credit should be given to it. He feels that his character is not sufficient to protect him. He feels that his brethren, far from looking upon him in that light, in which he anxiously deprives to be viewed by them, think him capable of being guilty of what he is accused of. He knows perfectly that he has not been guilty. He knows perfectly what he has done. But, perhaps, scarce any man can know perfectly what he himself is capable of doing. What the peculiar constitution of his own mind may or may not admit of is perhaps more or less a matter of doubt to every man. The trust and good opinion of his friends and neighbours tends more than anything to relieve him from this most disagreeable doubt, their distrust and unfavourable opinion to increase it. He may think himself very confident that their unfavourable judgment is wrong, but this confidence can seldom be so great as to hinder that judgment from making some impression upon him. And the greater his sensibility, the greater his delicacy, the greater his worth, in short, this impression is likely to be the greater. The agreement or disagreement, both of the sentiments and judgments of other people, with our own, is, in all cases, it must be observed, of more or less importance to us, exactly in proportion as we ourselves are more or less uncertain of the propriety of our own sentiments about the accuracy of our own judgments. A man of sensibility may sometimes feel great uneasiness, lest he should have yielded too much even to what may be called an honourable passion, to his just indignation, perhaps, at the injury which may have been done either to himself or to his friend. He is anxiously afraid lest, meaning only to act with spirit and to do justice, he may, from the too great vehemence of his emotion, have done a real injury to some other person, who, though not innocent, may not have been altogether so guilty as he at first apprehended. The opinion of other people becomes, in this case, of the utmost importance to him. Their approbation is the most healing balsam, their disapprobation the bitterest and most tormenting poison that can be poured into his uneasy mind. When he is perfectly satisfied with every part of his own conduct, the judgment of other people is of less importance to him. There are some very noble and beautiful arts in which the degree of excellence can be determined only by a certain nicety of taste, of which the decisions, however, appear always in some measure uncertain. There are others in which the success admits either of clear demonstration or very satisfactory proof. Among the candidates for excellence in those different arts, the anxiety about the public opinion is always much greater in the former than in the latter. The beauty of poetry is a matter of such nicety that a young beginner can scarce ever be certain that he has attained it. Nothing delights him so much, therefore, as the favourable judgments of his friends and of the public, and nothing mortifies him so severely as the contrary. The one establishes the other shakes, the good opinion which he is anxious to entertain concerning his own performances. Experience and success may in time give him a little more confidence in his own judgment. He is at all times, however, liable to be most severely mortified by the unfavourable judgments of the public. Racine was so disgusted by the indifferent success of his Phaedra, the finest tragedy, perhaps, that is extant in any language, that though in the vigour of his life, and at the height of his abilities, he resolved to write no more for the stage. That great poet used frequently to tell his son that the most paltry and impertinent criticism had always given him more pain than the highest and justest eulogy had ever given him pleasure. The extreme sensibility of Voltaire to the slightest censure of the same kind is well known to everybody. The Dunciad of Mr. Pope is an everlasting monument of how much the most correct, as well as the most elegant and harmonious of all the English poets, had been heard by the criticisms of the lowest and most contemptible authors. Gray, who joins the sublimity of Milton, the elegance and harmony of Pope, and to whom nothing is wanting to render him, perhaps the first poet of the English language, but to have written a little more, is said to have been so much hurt by a foolish and impertinent parody of two of his finest odes, that he never afterwards attempted any considerable work. Those men of letters who value themselves upon what is called fine writing in prose approach somewhat to the sensibility of poets.
Mathematicians, on the contrary, who may have the most perfect assurance both of the truth and of the importance of their discoveries, are frequently very indifferent about the reception which they may meet with from the public. The two greatest mathematicians that I ever have had the honor to be known to, and, I believe, the two greatest that have lived in my time, Dr. Robert Simpson of Glasgow and Dr. Matthew Stewart of Edinburgh, never seem to feel even the slightest uneasiness from the neglect with which the ignorance of the public received some of their most valuable works. The great work of Sir Isaac Newton, his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, I have been told, was for several years neglected by the public. The tranquillity of that great man, it is probable, never suffered, upon that account, the interruption of a single quarter of an hour. Natural philosophers and their independency upon the public opinion approached nearly to mathematicians, and, in their judgment, concerning the merit of their own discoveries and observations, enjoy some degree of the same security and tranquility. The morals of those different classes of men of letters are, perhaps, sometimes somewhat affected by this very great difference in their situation with regard to the public. Mathematicians and natural philosophers, from their independency upon the public opinion, have little temptation to form themselves into factions and cabals, either for the support of their own reputation or for the depression of that of their rivals. They are almost always men of the most amiable simplicity of manners, who live in good harmony with one another, are the friends of one another's reputation, enter into no intrigue in order to secure the public applause, but are pleased when their works are approved of, without being either much vexed or very angry when they are neglected. It is not always the same case with poets, or with those who value themselves upon what is called fine writing. They are very apt to divide themselves into a sort of literary factions, each cabal being often avowedly and almost always secretly the mortal enemy of the reputation of each other, and employing all the mean arts of intrigue and solicitation to preoccupy the public opinion in favor of the works of its own members, and against those of its enemies and rivals. In France, Desprio and Racine did not think it below them to set themselves at the head of the literary cabal in order to depress the reputation, first of Quinault and Perrault, and afterwards of Fontanella and Lamotte, and even to treat the good La Fontaine with a species of most disrespectful kindness. In England, the amiable Mr. Addison did not think it unworthy of his gentle and modest character to set himself at the head of a little cabal of the same kind, in order to keep down the rising reputation of Mr. Pope, Mr. Fontanella, in writing the lives and characters of the members of the Academy of Sciences, a Society of Mathematicians, and Natural Philosophers, has frequent opportunities of celebrating the amiable simplicity of their manners, a quality which, he observes, was so universal among them as to be characteristical rather of that whole class of men of letters than of any individual Mr. D'Alembert in writing the lives and characters of the members of the French Academy, a society of poets and fine writers, or of those who are supposed to be such, seems not to have had such frequent opportunities of making any remark of this kind, and nowhere pretends to represent this amiable quality as characteristical of that class of men of letters whom he celebrates. Our uncertainty concerning our own merit and our anxiety to think favorably of it should together naturally enough make us desirous to know the opinion of other people concerning it, to be more than ordinarily elevated when that opinion is favorable, and to be more than ordinarily mortified when it is otherwise. But they should not make us desirous either of obtaining the favorable or of avoiding unfavorable opinion. By intrigue and cabal, when a man has bribed all the judges, the most unanimous decision of the court, though it may gain him his lawsuit, cannot give him any assurance that he was in the right, and had he carried on his lawsuit merely to satisfy himself that he was in the right, he never would have bribed the judges. But though he wished to find himself in the right, he wished likewise to gain his lawsuit, and therefore he bribed the judges. If praise were no consequence to us, but as a proof of our own praiseworthiness, we never should endeavor to obtain it by unfair means. But though to wise men it is, at least in doubtful cases of principal consequence upon his account, it is likewise of some consequence upon its own account, and therefore we cannot, indeed, upon such occasions, call them wise men, 
but men very much above the common level have sometimes attempted both to obtain praise and to avoid blame by very unfair means. Praise and blame express what actually are praiseworthiness and blameworthiness, what naturally ought to be the sentiments of other people with regard to our character and conduct. The love of praise is the desire of obtaining the favorable sentiments of our brethren. The love of praiseworthiness is the desire of rendering ourselves the proper object of those sentiments. So far as those two principles resemble and are akin to one another, the like affinity and resemblance take place between the dread of blame and that of blameworthiness. The man who desires to do, or who actually does, a praiseworthy action may likewise desire the praise which is due to it, and sometimes perhaps more than is due to it. The two principles are in this case blended together. How far his conduct may have been influenced by the one and how far by the other may frequently be unknown even to himself. It must almost always be so to other people who are disposed to lessen the merit of his conduct, imputed chiefly or altogether to the mere love of praise or to what they call mere vanity. They who are disposed to think more favorably of it, impute it chiefly or altogether to the love of praiseworthiness, to the love of what is really honorable and noble in human conduct, to the desire not merely of obtaining, but of deserving the approbation and applause of his brethren. The imagination of the spectator throws upon it either the one color or the other, according either to his habits of thinking or to the favor of dislike, which he may bear to the person whose conduct he is considering. Some splendid philosophers, in judging of human nature, have done as peevish individuals are apt to do in judging of the conduct of one another, and have imputed to the love of praise, or to what they call vanity, every action which ought to be ascribed to that of praiseworthiness. I shall hereafter have occasion to give an account of some of their systems, and shall not at present stop to examine them. Very few men can be satisfied with their own private consciousness that they have attained those qualities or performed those actions which they admire and think praiseworthy in other people, unless it is, at the same time, generally acknowledged that they possess the one or have performed the other, or, in other words, unless they have actually obtained that praise which they think due both to the one and to the other. In this respect, however, men differ considerably from one another some seem indifferent about the praise when in their own minds they are perfectly satisfied that they have attained the praiseworthiness others appear much less anxious about the praiseworthiness than about the praise no man can be completely or even tolerably satisfied with having avoided everything blameworthy in his conduct unless he has likewise avoided the blame or the reproach a wise man may frequently neglect praise even when he has best deserved it but in all matters of serious consequence he will most carefully endeavor so to regulate his conduct as to avoid not only blameworthiness, but as much as possible every probable imputation of blame. He will never, indeed, avoid blame by doing anything which he judges blameworthy, by omitting any part of his duty, or by neglecting any opportunity of doing anything which he judges to be really and greatly praiseworthy. But with these modifications, he will most anxiously and carefully avoid it, to show much anxiety about praise, even for praiseworthy actions, is seldom a mark of great wisdom, but generally of some degree of weakness. But in being anxious to avoid the shadow of blame or reproach, there may be no weakness, but frequently the most praiseworthy prudence. Many people, says Cicero, despise glory, who are yet most severely mortified by unjust reproach, and that most inconsistently. This inconsistency, however, seems to be founded in the unalterable principles of human nature. The all-wise author of nature has, in this manner, taught man to respect the sentiments and judgments of his brethren, and to be more or less pleased when they approve of his conduct, and to be more or less hurt when they disapprove of it. He has made man, if I may say so, the immediate judge of mankind, and has, in this respect, as in many others, created him after his own image and appointed him his vicegerent upon earth, to superintend the behavior of his brethren. They are taught by nature to acknowledge that power and jurisdiction which has thus conferred upon him to be more or less humbled and mortified when they have incurred his censure, and to be more or less elated when they have obtained his applause.
but though man has in this manner been rendered the immediate judge of mankind he has been rendered so only in the first instance and an appeal lies from his sentence to a much higher tribunal to the tribunal of their own consciences to that of the supposed impartial and well-informed spectator to that of the man within the breast the great judge and arbiter of their conduct the jurisdictions of those two tribunals are founded upon principles which though in some respects resembling and akin are however in reality different and distinct the jurisdiction of the man without is founded altogether in the desire of actual praise and in the aversion to actual blame the jurisdiction of man within is founded altogether in the desire of praiseworthiness and the aversion to blameworthiness in the desire of possessing those qualities and performing those actions which we love and admire in other people and in the dread of possessing those qualities and performing those actions which we hate and despise in other people if the man without should applaud us either for actions which we have not performed or for motives which had no influence upon us the man within can immediately humble that pride and elevation of mind which such groundless acclamations might otherwise occasion by telling us that as we know that we do not deserve them we render ourselves despicable by accepting them if on the contrary the man without should reproach us either for actions which we never performed or for motives which had no influence upon those which we may have performed the man within may immediately correct this false judgment and assure us that we are by no means the proper objects of that censure which has so unjustly been bestowed upon us but in this and in some other cases the man within seems sometimes as it were astonished and confounded by the vehemence and clamour of the man without the violence and loudness with which blame is sometimes poured out upon us seems to stupefy and benumb our natural sense of praiseworthiness and blameworthiness and not the judgments of man within though not perhaps absolutely altered or perverted are however so much shaken in the steadiness and firmness of their decision that their natural effect in securing the tranquillity of mind is frequently in a great measure destroyed we scarce dare to absolve ourselves when all the brethren appear loudly to condemn us the supposed impartial spectator of our conduct seems to give his opinion in our favour with fear and hesitation when that of all the real spectators when that of all those with whose eyes and from whose station he endeavours to consider it is unanimously and violently against us in such cases this demigod within the breast appears like the demigods of the poets though partly of immortal yet partly too of mortal extraction like the demigods of the poets though partly of immortal yet partly too of mortal extraction when his judgments are steadily and firmly directed by the sense of praiseworthiness and blameworthiness he seems to act suitably to divine extraction but when he suffers himself to be astonished and confounded by the judgments of ignorant and weak men he discovers his connection with morality and appears to act suitably rather to the human than to the divine part of his origin in such cases the only effectual consolation of humbled and afflicted man lies in an appeal to a still higher tribunal to that of the all-seeing judge of the world whose eye can never be deceived and whose judgment can never be perverted a firm confidence in the unerring rectitude of this great tribunal before which his innocence is in due time to be declared and his virtue to be finally rewarded can alone support him under the weakness and despondency of his own mind under the perturbation and astonishment of the man within the breast whom nature has set up as in this life the great guardian not only of his innocence but of his tranquillity our happiness in this life is thus upon many occasions dependent upon the humble hope and expectation of a life to come a hope and expectation deeply rooted in human nature which can alone support its lofty ideas of its own dignity can alone illumine the dreary prospect of its continually approaching mortality and maintain its cheerfulness under the heaviest calamities to which from the disorders of this life it may sometimes be exposed that there is a world to come where exact justice will be done to every man where every man will be ranked with those who in the moral and intellectual qualities are really his equals where the owner of those humble talents and virtues which from being depressed by fortune had in this life 
no opportunity of displaying themselves which were unknown not only to the public but which he himself could scarce be sure that he possessed and for which even the man within the breast could scarce venture to afford him any distinct and clear testimony where that modest silent and unknown merit will be placed upon a level and sometimes above those who in this world had enjoyed the highest reputation and who from the advantage of their situation have been enabled to perform the most splendid and dazzling actions is a doctrine in every respect so vulnerable so comfortable to the weakness so flattering to the grandeur of human nature that the virtuous man who has the misfortune to doubt of it cannot possibly avoid wishing most earnestly and anxiously to believe it it could never have been exposed to the derision of the scoffer had not the distributions of rewards and punishments which some of the most zealous asserters have taught us was to be made in that world to come been too frequently in direct opposition to all our moral sentiments that the assiduous courtier is often more favoured than the faithful and active servant that attendance and adulation are often shorter and surer roads of preferment than merit or service and that a campaign at versailles or st james is often worth two either in germany or flanders is a complaint which we have all heard from many a vulnerable but discontented old officer but what is considered as the greatest reproach even to the weakness of earthly sovereigns has been ascribed as an act of justice to divine perfection and the duties of devotion the public and private worship of the deity have been represented even by men of virtue and abilities as the sole virtues which can either entitle to reward or exempt from punishment in the life to come they were the virtues perhaps most suitable to their station and in which they themselves chiefly excelled and we are all naturally disposed to overrate the excellencies of our own characters in the discourse which the eloquent and philosophical Macillan pronounced on giving his benediction to the standards of the regiment of the catenate there is the following address to the officers what is the most deplorable in your situation gentlemen is that in a life hard and painful in which the services and the duties sometimes go beyond the rigour and severity of the most austere cloisters you suffer always in vain for the life to come and frequently even for this life alas the solitary monk in his cell obliged to mortify the flesh and to subject it to the spirit is supported by the hope of an assured recompense and by the secret unction of that grace which softens the yoke of the lord but you on the bed of death can you dare to represent to him your fatigues and the daily hardships of your employment can you dare to solicit him for any recompense and in all the exertions that you have made in all your violences that you have done to yourselves what is there that he ought to place in his own account the best days of your life however have been sacrificed to your profession and ten years service has more worn out your body than would perhaps have done the whole life of repentance and mortification alas my brother one single day of those sufferings consecrated to the lord would perhaps have obtained you an eternal happiness one single action painful to nature and offered up to him would perhaps have secured you to the inheritance of the saints and you would have done all this and in vain for this world to compare in this manner the futile mortifications of a monastery to the ennobling hardships and hazards of war to suppose that one day or one hour employed in the former should in the eye of the great judge of the world have more merit than a whole life spent honorably in the latter is surely contrary to all our moral sentiments to all the principles by which nature has taught us to regulate our contempt or admiration it is this spirit however which while it has reserved the celestial regions for monks and friars or for those whose conduct and conversation resemble those of monks and friars has condemned to the infernal all the heroes all the statesmen and lawgivers all the poets and philosophers of former ages all those who have invented improved or excelled in the arts which contribute to the subsistence to the conveniency or to the ornament of human life all the great protectors instructors and benefactors of mankind all those to whom the natural sense of praiseworthiness forces us to ascribe the highest merit and most exalted virtue can we wonder that so strange an application of this most respectable doctrine should sometimes have exposed it to contempt and derision with those at least who had themselves perhaps no great taste or turn for the devout and contemplative virtues